This is Dr. Polito, and this is the DNA Structure and Function Lecture. This is normally divided into uh, a two-day lecture. The first day we cover the history of DNA as well as its replication. And we start diving into some gene expression, and then we go into, uh, on day two, the control of gene expression, and we start talking about mutations in cancer. So um, this PowerPoint is just DNA. There'll be a separate PowerPoint for um, genes and gene regulation. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the basic history of DNA. Um, this, these next two slides, you can use as a sort of study guide to understand what we're going through here, okay? All right, so here we go, the beginning. We're going to go all the way back to around when uh, Mendel was publishing his work on P hybridization. And there was this gentleman named uh, Miescher who discovered that there was a certain uh, chemical specific to cell nuclei. Um, he was studying pus. Okay, so back then, um, back in the early days, there weren't a lot of uh, labs selling materials, and so you had to go out and find you know, what you could. And so doctors and other medical practitioners and surgeons had easy access to things like pus. Okay, Now, pus has white blood cells in it, and white blood cells have nuclei, so pus was a really um, good source, however disgusting, of studying things like cells. And Miescher discovered this stuff in uh, the nuclei, and he called it nucleon. And a couple uh, decades later, he, uh, not he, rather, but it was discovered that nucleon turned out to be an acid. And so they changed the name to nucleic acid. Still didn't know much about it, though. And eventually they learned that there were two um, different sugars associated with it. And so you had ribose and deoxyribose. And so instead of just plain old nucleic acid, we had ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid. By the early 1900s, okay, so this is when Mendel was being rediscovered and people were talking about chromosomes and watching things like mitosis and meiosis. Um, slightly off the radar there was the fact that DNA turned out, and RNA turned out to have um, building blocks. And there were only four kinds of building blocks they found in the DNA. Um, so there was the adenine, the thymine, the cytosine, and the guanine, which were the nitrogenous bases. Okay. And so if you remember from an earlier chapter, let's make sure we remember this, that uh, the structure of a nucleic acid is um, made out of nucleotides, right? So that's the subunit. And so if you draw the cartoony version of this, you start out with a sugar which is five carbons, one, two, three, four, five carbons, okay? And so this carbon here is the five prime carbon, five prime, and this carbon over here is the three prime, okay? Attached to the one prime carbon, that is the nitrogenous base, okay? And that could be equal to, in DNA, either the A or the T or the C or the G, okay? I have no idea what happened with this line here. And um, in RNA, remember that the thymine is replaced by uracil. And then on the five prime carbon, there is a phosphate group, okay? So we have a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Those are the building blocks, okay? And so in the early 1900s, they learned that DNA was made out of A, T, C, and G. Now, when they did this, when they discovered this, the basic idea was that DNA was just a boring molecule of repeating subunits of A, T, C, and G. And the technology was good enough to distinguish these, the A, the T, and the C, and the G. And so when they did experiments, they assumed they were finding relatively constant proportions of these, so that there was 25% A, and 25% T, and 25% C, and G, and so on and so forth. They just thought these were repeating subunits. And so DNA was kind of a boring molecule. Nobody really thought too much of it. Um, also around this time, with the discovery of chromosomes, um, there was the idea that chromosomes are made out of both protein and DNA. Okay, And so the working model at the time was if you had this, this three-dimensional uh, chromosome, 
okay, with these banding patterns that you've seen. The idea is, is that the chromosome itself is sort of a scaffold of DNA. So you can think of like a 3D matrix of maybe, uh, you know, like a chain link or jello. And embedded within that mesh are Mendel's factors. Okay, so that was the idea. Okay, and even Mendel's factors, the idea of Mendel's factors was still theoretical. And there were a lot of people who didn't even believe that they were actual things, and it was just a good way of thinking about genes uh, or thinking about inheritance. Okay, so in the early 1900s, we had DNA being realized that it was this uh, repeating subunit of ATCG. <clears throat> All right, so in about 1915 or so, you had uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was this brilliant researcher. Um, who studied embryology, and he was actually one of the earliest pioneers of what you could think of as experimental biology. The idea that instead of going around and looking at things and notating things, to actually start doing experimentation. Morgan was a very strong proponent of experimentation, and in his pioneering work in fruit flies, studying um, inheritance and thinking about evolution and um, you know, trying to understand Darwin, uh, learning about Mendel, what he was able to do was, uh, after a few years of some hard work, determine that Mendel's factors were actually real life things and they were in fact carried on the chromosomes. Okay, so even though he didn't discover chromosomes, Morgan popularized the theory of chromosomal inheritance. Okay, um, and again, chromosomes are made out of both DNA and protein, and so probably Morgan even thought that um, it was the protein that was made uh, out of, that the genes were made out of protein. Okay, and it's important to realize here why people were so hung up on proteins being the genetic material instead of DNA, and the reason is pretty simple. Proteins are made out of amino acids, and there are 20 different kinds of amino acids that can be linked together in any of the infinite combination of ways. And the average protein is over 300 amino acids long, okay? That's a lot. In contrast, DNA is only made out of four things, uh, A, T, C, and G. And at the time of all this, they even thought, as I said earlier, that it was just these repeating units. So DNA was not very popular as the candidate for the genetic material. Okay, and so I just said all this. By 1928, we had people really digging in to understanding what genes were made out of, what chromosomes were made out of, or rather what the inheritable uh, material was made out of. Okay, so after World War I, right, so around this time, there was a huge, uh, pneumonia epidemic, okay, influenza, the virus, and Griffith was hard at work trying to develop a vaccination for it to save lives. And in his work, as we'll learn later, he showed that the genetic material could, um, or rather he discovered uh, a system where the genetic material could be studied. And we'll just leave it at that for now. We'll get to his experiments later. By the 1940s, uh, Avery and his friends, his colleagues, uh, McCarty and McLeod, identified that Griffin's, uh, Griffith's transforming substance, as we're going to call it, turns out to most likely be DNA. Okay, And they worked for 16 years on this. Again, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, now here's the thing. Even though all of this work over decades has shown again and again that DNA was the genetic material, not the proteins, people were still really skeptical about this because not only was very little known about DNA, but proteins really just made the most sense for reasons I talked about earlier. Okay, but by the 1950s, a gentleman named Shargraf was able to um, finally dig into the proportions of the A and the T and the C and the G. And as we'll learn later, he was able to show that A and T were always found in the same ratio and C and G were always found in the same ratio. Okay, so it wasn't 25% across the board, but there was actually some kind of distinction here between the ATs and the Cs and Gs. Now, he didn't notice it at the time. He didn't recognize the importance of his work at the time, and it didn't take until uh, a few years later when he shared his ideas with Watson and Crick that um, his work would be um, popularized. 
Okay, so a few years after Shargraf published his work, Hershey and Chase finally put the last nail in the coffin of um, proteins as a candidate for the genetic material and definitively showed that it was in fact DNA. That's a pretty cool experiment we'll get into later. Okay, and then just a short little while later after that, Watson and Crick published their, uh, their structure of DNA, um, helped by the insights of Rosalind Franklin we'll talk about. All right, so here's a more detailed slide showing uh, a few more people and groups that we are not going to cover in today's lecture. But if you're interested in the history and the story of this stuff, I definitely encourage you to dig into some details here. Particularly, there's, um, there's uh, Sutton and Boveri. They discovered chromosomes originally and proposed them as Mendel's factors, or at least related. They basically showed that chromosomes obeyed Mendel's laws. And then, um, let's see, Beadle and Tatum have a famous experiment with some bread mold. And let's see, um, well, those are the big ones. Other than, let's see, McClintock, she's the one that showed that um, the patterns in corn, those colors that you see in uh, maize, are actually due to what we call jumping genes, or transposons. We'll learn about those later. Okay, so anyway. The point at the very beginning of the story, that um, the hunt for DNA, we have to understand what the characteristics of this mysterious genetic material are, okay? And so when people set out to do this work, they wanted to, um, to understand this, and so there were three basic requirements of the genetic material. So whatever it was, it had to be able to store information, right? I mean, it had to store all the instructions to life to go from a single cell to you know, uh, from a zygote to, you know, you, a person, okay? And then it also had to be able uh, to be replicated with uh, high fidelity, okay? So high fidelity, not just a movie with John Cusack, but also what that means is high faithfulness, right? Fidelity is faithfulness. And so high fidelity means it was able to um, replicate without making mistakes, right? So again, we go from one cell to 32 trillion cells, which is a whole lot of cells. And in order to do that, I think that's 32 billion. Let's add another three zeros there. That's 32 trillion cells. And so going from one to 32 trillion without making many mistakes, that's, you know, that's a pretty tall order. And then in addition, whatever it was, had to be able to undergo rare occasional changes, right? So Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection requires mutation the ability to change genotype, okay? So, we're going to go over three key experiments right now. Griffiths, Avery's, and Hershey and Chase's. So here we go. <clears throat> Griffith, again, so this was a guy who was trying to discover or develop a vaccine for pneumonia, okay? And so he was studying within the system. He had two types of pneumonia. He had a smooth strain, which was lethal, and when you injected the S or smooth strain into mice, what that did was it killed them, okay? And then there was the harmless strain or the rough strain. It was benign in mice. It was able to let them survive, okay? And by the way, what's going on here? What's SNR? Well, they knew under the microscope that when they looked at smooth bacteria, okay, so here's a, let's see, here's a Petri dish. Oops, here's a Petri dish. Okay, and when you grow the S strain, they form these very nice, neat, spherical, smooth coating, there's that line again, smooth coating um, colonies. Okay, in contrast, the rough bacteria would grow irregularly shaped ones. Okay, and the reason for this is the phenotype of smooth was basically the cell was able to create a shell around it or a capsule, as they call it, okay? And so the smooth bacteria were able to make capsules, the R bacteria were not, and that's what distinguished them. So the idea, you can think, is that the smooth bacteria were not able to be attacked by the mice immune system, or our immune system, and because the bacteria were resistant to attack, they were able to grow and kill, whereas the rough bacteria were able to, well, they were susceptible to the immune system, and so they were easily killed. Okay, so here's that first experiment. You can think of it as a control. You infect the mice with either the smooth or the rough, and you look at them, and they die or they don't. 
Okay. So here's the experiment. I'm going to skip this because um, this really should go next. That's a summary of the experiments, but we're talking about the experiments still. So I have to switch these slides around. All right, so here we go. Here's live S, living S. And what we're going to do is we're going to treat it with some fire. We're going to kill it with fire. We're going to heat inactivate it. And sure enough, these dead cells, when added to mice, were not going to kill them, right? The mice remained alive. If we took this heat inactivated S, this dead bacteria, and we mixed it with living harmless bacteria, okay, and we infected cells with this combination of the living and the dead, it ended up killing the mice. And not only that, but the bacteria that were recovered were smooth, right? What? How did that happen? The R strain was somehow transformed into the S strain. So there was some substance in heat killed S that was able to magically transform the rough. And so the quest begins to detect whatever this transforming substance was, right? So the idea is that dead S converted R's genotype and therefore its genotype. That's the key to this, okay? Understand, at this point in time, they understood that what you looked like, so for example, that S bacteria, the one with the really thick coating on it, its phenotype, okay, was dictated by its genotype. And so if you were able to transform a phenotype, you were able to transform a genotype. And so here we have something, this transforming substance is most likely, whatever it is, the genetic material. Okay, the question was, is what is it? So this transformation principle he came up with, this unknown, mysterious, heritable substance, change in genotype leads to a change in phenotype. But what was it? Was it DNA? Was it RNA? Was it protein? They knew that chromosomes were made out of DNA and proteins at this point. Okay, so those are the two most likely candidates. Of course, RNA is also nucleic acid. That's also possible too. Okay, so this slide also just summarizes the experiment we just did. I like my mice better. Anyway, here we go. Avery, Avery McLeod and McCarty. Okay, I believe Avery was English. So it was an English, a Scotsman, and a Irishman. Okay, it's like the beginning of a bad biology joke. And we had three different groups, all friends, all colleagues, working with very, very um, ambitious focus to basically uh, discover what Griffith's transforming substance was. Okay, And this work took them 16 years, 16 years of their life. And this is what they did. They basically repeated the experiments that Griffith did, except instead of in mice, they used test tubes. Okay, you might have heard the phrase in vitro before. In vitro literally means it's Latin, for, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Latin for in glass, okay, in a test tube. The mice experiments, in contrast, were called in vivo experiments, okay, in life. So we have in vitro and in vivo experiments. In vitro experiments are in glass or in test tubes. So you can think of in vivo as a more natural kind of experiment, um, you know, doing the work within the organism. In vitro is a little bit more of an artificial environment. The benefit of working with in vivo, therefore, is that you're more likely to see real things. The drawback is you have no idea what's going on inside an organism. It's a big black box, right? There's so much we still don't understand, even after all these decades. In contrast, in a test tube, you can isolate and purify and understand every single component of your experiment. So you can be more precise and systematic. The problem is you have to make sure that whatever you see in an in vitro experiment is um, uh, consistent with what you see in vivo, okay? All right, so this is what they did. They basically took the pneumonia, okay, and they were able to put it in a test tube, <clears throat> okay, and then what they did, okay, well, here, I'll tell you what, let's, let's forget the, forget this diagram for a minute, you can read this on your own, I'm just going to explain this to you in a very plain English way, okay, so, we take, let's set this up, here is a test tube filled with S bacteria, 
okay, that we know that S bacteria, if we plate it on a Petri dish, we're going to get little perfect circles, okay. And let's take some rough strain, okay, and plate that, and we would sure enough get the rough strain uh, colonies, okay. Now, if we take some of this S, we put it in a tube, and we uh, heat shock it, right, so a little flame here, so this is, we'd say heat inactivated S strain, okay? And so we plate this on a dish, okay, nothing's gonna grow. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some tubes of R, okay, so here's some R, and here's some more R. These, we're gonna set up our experiment here. We're gonna do four of these, okay? And when we set up these four, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix each of these with some of the heat inactivated S, okay? So in theory, this mixture should be able to go and kill a mouse as we discovered, okay? So here, let's say this one's our positive control. We mix the S and the R together, the X plus R, and then after we mix them, we're gonna plate them on a Petri dish and sure enough, we're going to see and recover smooth colonies, okay? In the second tube, so we'll say this is tube one, in the second tube, what we're going to do is, <clears throat> shortly before mixing it, we're going to add, we're going to add to this an enzyme that is able to shred proteins. Okay, they're called proteases. So we're going to treat this with proteases. The key is we're going to basically remove proteins. Okay, we're going to destroy the proteins, but we're still going to make sure that any DNA or any RNA is still there, okay? In test tube three, we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna treat it with something that shreds RNA called RNase, okay? RNase is an enzyme that shreds RNA. So in this tube, it's still gonna have its proteins, it's still gonna have its DNA, but it's no longer gonna have RNA, it's gonna be shredded. And then in this last tube, you can surmise and we're going to add to something called DNAs, okay? So DNAs destroys the DNA. So no DNA in here, but there'll be plenty of proteins and there'll be plenty of RNA, okay? So they treat each one of these tubes, this is tube four, with the heat inactivated S as well as either proteases, RNases, or DNAs, okay? And then they plate each one, right? And so when they plate each one of these, okay, so we have four Petri dishes, okay, the first, the second, and the third all recover living S bacteria. The last one doesn't. It's just plain old rough. And so what this did, and so everything I just summarized here, that was done. It took them 16 years of their lives to do all that work. And what they pr proved conclusively, I don't want to say prove here, they support conclusively that it was DNA that was Griffith's mysterious transforming substance, not RNA and not protein. Okay? S transforms R. Neither proteases nor RNases prevent transformation of R into S. DNA, however, does prevent transformation. Okay, those were the major findings of Avery McLeod and McCarty's groups. And then they did one more thing. They basically purified the substance as best they could, and then they measured out how big it was. And it turns out that if it was DNA, there was so much of it that it could have easily made up to about 1,600 nucleotides. Okay, now from what we know today, 1,600 nucleotides is more than enough A, T, Cs, and Gs to make a gene to encode for the phenotype of that capsule that we see in the S bacteria, okay? So, what's really going on here, as we know now, is we have a bacterial cell, okay, so if this was an S bacterial cell, in addition to its normal DNA, okay, if you guys recall, there's a chromosome there, that circular chromosome, there's also smaller pieces of DNA, little loops of DNA, called plasmids. Okay, and plasmids usually have one or a few genes that are doing uh, some specific job. 
In the case of the S. pneumonia bacteria, this plasmid encoded information so that the cell was able to create that capsule around it and protect itself. Okay, the rough bacteria did not have a plasmid. They did have their genome, of course. Okay, and so when we heat kill this guy and the cell dies, those plasmids get released into the solution, okay, along with the rest of the cell's contents, right? When we kill cells, they blow up, basically, they lice. And so we have now all of these plasmids everywhere. And so when we mixed the rough bacteria with the smooth bacteria, with the heat-killed smooth bacteria, bacterial cells do this very strange thing where they will be you know, floating around in an uh, environment, and they will literally just suck up whatever DNA is in the environment. Okay, it's called transduction. Oh, sorry, it's called transformation, not transduction. Um, so we actually borrowed the um, name that Griffith came up with, uh, the transforming substance. Okay, so transformation is when we allow a bacterial cell to pull in and take a plasmid, which it can then express and create whatever proteins are on it. And so we have the ability of the previously rough bacteria to now be S. Okay? So that was Avery's, uh, Avery McLeod and McCarty's work. Uh, that's just a summary of everything we just said. So, this evidence was overwhelming, and yet scientists, many of them, still didn't accept it. They really, really, really liked the idea that proteins and not DNA was a transforming substance, because proteins have 20 amino acids, okay? I mean, think of it this way. If I asked you to choose between a 20-letter alphabet or a 4-letter alphabet, and then pick one of those and go out and make the world, and the moon, but really the world. Make all the life on Earth and all of the different animals, whether it's the starfish or the birds or us or whatever, bacteria, you're always going to pick the one that has the most combinations in it. It just made sense, okay? DNA didn't make sense to people. And so the work continued even after Avery published his work, okay? People were still doing experiments to determine the genetic substance. Proof finally came with a really elegant experiment by Hershey and Chase that we're going to learn about now. And what they did was they used bacteriophages as a tool. What's a bacteriophage? You can watch this video on your own. If you download this PowerPoint and you go in here and you click the play button, um, you can play. I'll tell you what, I'll just play it for you guys right now. And you can feel free to fast forward if you've already seen this or if you don't feel like watching it right now. But I'm going to play it in its entirety right now. Bacteriophages, or phages, are viruses that infect bacteria. This is a T2 phage, which consists of DNA inside a protein coat. The reproductive cycle of the T2 phage begins when the tail fibers of the phage stick to the receptor sites on the surface of a host bacterium, such as E. coli. The phage injects its DNA into the host cell, leaving the empty protein coat outside. The DNA of the host cell is destroyed and host cell enzymes and nucleotides are commandeered to replicate the phage DNA, making more phage DNA. The host cell's enzymes and ribosomes are used to manufacture phage proteins. Phage parts accumulate and assemble to form phages. A phage enzyme digests the bacterial cell wall and the cell ruptures, or lysis. As many as 200 phages spill out. Each of them may go on to infect another cell. This diagram summarizes the reproductive cycle of bacteriophage T2. Okay, I guess it's over. Okay, they, um, these videos aren't known for having definitive ends. You just have to kind of wait for them. That was kind of neat. Those look kind of like, uh, uh, I always like to think of these as moon landers, right? They kind of look like moon landers or maybe, um, in another picture, I'll show you my other idea here. So maybe they're, they're alien bobbleheads, right? There you go. So anyway, you can see here, this is an electron micrograph. This is actually what they actually look like under the electron microscope. Um, <clears throat> of course, colorized. But you can see there's the uh, the capsule, okay? And you can see the uh, all the little details here of them basically landing. And then you can see here they're injecting their material, okay?
here's the key to this experiment. Phages, okay, so by the way, there, there's a word that you should know. A phage is simply a virus that is specific to prokaryotes. Okay, so phages, prokaryotes. Phages are viruses that infect prokaryotes. Okay, so we don't have phages. We don't have to worry about phages, but bacteria do. Okay, so here's the key. The coat, the DNA inside and the coat on the outside, the coat is made out of proteins, okay? And the core is made out of nucleic acid, okay, or DNA. Or in this case, DNA. There are phages that are made out of RNA, but don't worry about that. Okay, so we either have, we have DNA or we have protein. Okay, nucleic acid is very, very rich in phosphorus, but very, very poor in sulfur. Okay, in contrast, proteins are very, very rich in sulfur, but very, very poor in phosphate. So, if you take a Petri dish, okay, and this Petri dish has some bacteria in it, and you infect these bacteria with a phage, but you include radioactive phosphorus, P32, what's going to come out of that after a few days are phages that are radioactive in their DNA, okay? If you do a separate experiment where you culture phages, but you add S35, Okay. A few days later, you're going to get phages that are enriched in S35. Okay. So basically, you can either label the coating or you can label the insides. Okay. So if the coating is labeled, then you have... Um, sorry, we just had a news announcement from Windows 10. I have to deal with that um, setting. Anyway, so the 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 capsule, okay, the capsid rather, can be radioactive with S35 or the core can be radioactive with P32, okay? Obviously, you're not going to do both at the same time. And the reason for that is we want to trace where the radiation goes in the experiment, okay? And you'll see what I mean in a second. So what we do, okay, what we do, let me skip ahead here, okay, so this is what we do. We take an Erlenmeyer flask filled with bacteria, and you zoom into that, and then this is a single bacterial cell right here, okay? And we infect these cells with a, um, a phage that has a radioactive protein, uh, the cap, uh, capsid, okay? <clears throat> so we give the phage a little bit of time to bind to the bacterial cell, and then we place them in a blender. Okay, and what the blender does is it knocks off those little alien bobbleheads. Okay, but before they were knocked off, they had the opportunity to inject their genetic material. Okay, so again, the underlying assumption here is that phages change the genotype of the bacteria cell. And in order to change the genotype, you have to literally put something in it. So the question becomes, what's inside? Is it the DNA or is it the protein? Okay, whatever goes in the cell becomes the genetic material. So, after they blend it and they knock off all these teeny tiny little viruses, okay, they then centrifuge it. And what the centrifuge does is it allows the, the relatively heavier bacterial cells to pellet at the base of that, but the very, very teeny tiny light viruses don't. They stay in the liquid called the supernatant. Okay. And sure enough, when they did this experiment, they found that the supernatant, the liquid component, was hot or radioactive, and the pellet was cold or not radioactive. And then they did the exact same experiment, but instead they used the radio labeled P32. And sure enough, when they looked at the centrifugation, the supernatant in this case was cold. It wasn't radioactive, but the pellet was. And what this told them was that the DNA was in the cells now, okay? So this was the definitive experiment that said DNA is the transforming substance, okay? Now, this was early 19, what, 1952 or so. In parallel to Hershey and Chase's work, okay, there was a lot of advances going on 
um, at the time. And so if we rewind a little bit, maybe a decade in advance, there were new chemical techniques that were allowing a much more detailed analysis of the bases within DNA and within individual organisms. Okay, so this is where Shargaff comes in. So what he was able to do was purify DNA from different species and then isolate the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's. Okay, and so what he was able to test was that theory of um, whether DNA was these repeating units of A, T, C, G, or if there was something else going on. Okay, so the hypothesis was very simple. Let's say you had um, a sample of DNA from a species, right? So you had a test tube, and you were able to isolate all the DNA. Okay, let's say that this was a whole... Uh, uh, one milliliter, <clears throat> okay, and from this one milliliter you were able to isolate just the A and just the T and just the C and just the C and just the T, <laughs> just the A, T, C, and G, okay, and you would predict that each one of these would be 0.25 milliliters, okay, or 25% of the original substance. If it wasn't 0.25, then you had something more interesting going on, right? And you can imagine where this is going. So these are Shargaff's original data. So you can see in humans, 31% of the genome in humans was uh, adenine, okay? 31 and a half was thymine, 19 0.1 was guanine, and 18.4 was cytosine. Okay, now even though these are very specific numbers, understand these are actual experimentally derived numbers. So you can see that even though these are slightly off, these are about the same, okay? So you would see that these two are equivalent. And likewise, the 19.1 the and the 18.4, they're about equivalent too. So you can say that this is about 31, about 31, about 19, about 19, okay? <clears throat> Clearly, this was not... 25, 25, 25, 24, okay? And what was really neat was when he went out and he looked at samples for any human, so let's say he sampled 100 people's white blood cells, they were always the exact same numbers, okay? So within a species, they were consistent. However, when he looked at other species, so for example, Morgan's Drosophila melanogasters, the fruit flies that Morgan studied, instead of 31, they had 27.3, or about 27, 28 or so, okay? And so they had just completely different ratios of these four, okay? Corn had about, let me think about it, about 25% each, that's kind of neat, okay? Neurospora crossa, that's the bread mold, that was beetle and tatum, we're not covering in this lecture. They had different, right? So you can see about 23 and about 27, okay? E. coli had different numbers. And uh, Bacillus, which was a different species of bacteria, also had different numbers, okay? And so what Shargaff was able to do, independent of anybody else, just looking at these numbers, he came up with what are today known as Shargaff's law, or I'm sorry, Shargaff's rules, okay? The proportion of A always equals the proportion of T, and the proportion of G always equals the proportion of C, okay? And of course, when you add them all together, you get 100. What that means, one way of distilling that is, if you add A and G together, okay, so A and G, or if you add T and G, I'm sorry, T and C together, you're going to get 50%, okay? So that means I can give you any one of these numbers, and you can tell me all the others, all right? So let's try one simple problem. Let's say that you discovered in some unknown DNA that A was equal to 15%, <clears throat> okay? So tell me what T, C and GR. Go ahead, I'll give you a second. Or pause. Okay, so A and T, okay, are the same. And so if A was equal to 15%, T had to be equal to 15%. Okay, and if you add those two together, what do you get? You get 30, okay? And so what's left from 100? 70. And so 70 divided by 2, there's that weird, ah, that line again. 70 divided by 2 is equal to 35, right? So here we go. So A is equal to 15, T is equal to 15, and that means C and G together had to be equal to 60, right? Or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 70. And so each one of these would be 35, okay? So the simpler way to do that would be 15 for A, okay? What that means is um, 
So 15 plus x equals 50. Okay, and so x equals 35. And so there's your g. Okay, so to summarize, not 25% each. It showed species variability. What that means is it was different between different species. <clears throat> and it showed consistency within a single species. Okay, that's Shargaf. In parallel to Shargaf doing his work, through the 1940s and 50s, we had people working on the actual structure of DNA. So people who studied the structure of DNA approached it from two different ways. There was the experimentalists like Rosalind Franklin and her group uh, in Wilkinson's lab. And then there were model people, people who uh, built models of DNA, and that was Watson and Crick. Okay, so Rosalind Franklin um, studied DNA's shape by basically bombarding it with x-rays. Here, this is how it works, right? So imagine this is a little crystal of DNA. Okay, it's a crystal, which means that the DNA inside that crystal is all in the exact same orientation. Okay, so you take this crystal, and you take an electron gun, I'm sorry, uh, an x-ray gun. Okay, you take an x-ray gun, and you shoot x-rays, and then some of them pass through, and you can expose a piece of film behind it. Okay, and so you take a picture of it, and then you rotate the crystal a little bit, you take another picture, and another picture, and another picture, and you basically get a stack of images of these two-dimensional silhouettes that you can then use to build into a 3D model. Okay. Now, when Watson and Crick were building their model, they were, instead of doing experiments, they were just thinking about it. They were basically using the laws of physics and chemistry and coming up with a, a most likely structure. Here was the flaw in their thinking. Okay, so if you think of how we now see a DNA double helix, okay, it's basically like a twisted ladder, right, with the bases on the inside, and on the outside is that sugar phosphate backbone. But Watson and Crick, thinking that in order to be the genetic material, enzymes had to read those letters. They placed the nucleic acids on the outsides. I'm sorry, not the nucleic acids, the bases, the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's. Okay, They put them on the outside, thinking that the enzymes reading the DNA would read it from the outside. So they didn't even, they just had no idea. Okay, now Wilkinson, Rosalind's, or Rosalind's boss, who they didn't get along very well, Rosalind's boss was sitting next to, um, I think it was Crick, as the story goes, at some conference. And uh, Crick was lamenting to Wilkinson that they were stumped and they couldn't figure out, uh, they just couldn't figure out how to piece it together. And Wilkinson showed Crick a picture of Rosalind's uh, DNA. And when Crick saw this, he got excited and he ran back to the lab and the rest, as they say, is history. What this picture shows to the trained observer, okay, is um, basically what you're seeing here is that this is the double strand of DNA, okay? Your eye is up here looking down at it, okay? So you're looking down at basically a spiral staircase. This X configuration here showed that the DNA was in fact a double helix, okay? And then these really dark spots were able to show, um, it depends on what you read. The, so these dark spots here, um, these are the hydrogen bondings between the base pairs. But this really dark spot here and this really dark spot here, that's what told Crick when he saw this picture that he was looking at the phosphates. The phosphates were on the outside, okay? So instead of his models looking like this, he realized, and the phosphates being on the inside, no. It turned out, when they went back to the lab and he modeled it this way, everything fit together perfectly, and they were able to publish the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid, the double helix. And this is the famous picture of um, this 
is uh, Crick, and this is Watson. Indi incidentally, uh, Watson here, he was a 23-year-old uh, uh, postdoc from uh, the, the States, and Crick was a British, an older British researcher. At, uh, I think they were in Cambridge. Okay, he's still alive as of today. He was actually in charge of Cold Spring National Harbor, uh, the the lab up on Long Island, actually where I grew up, and uh, he was there for many years. And he ended up having to resign in 2007 because he made some very insensitive comments on the relationship between genetic uh, uh, genetic inheritance and in, uh, intelligence or IQ within the races. So um, he was basically ousted, and uh, he, in uh, after losing that position, he actually had to sell his Nobel Prize medal. He's the only Nobel Prize winner in history that had to sell his Nobel Prize. He ended up selling it for $4.1 million, okay, at some auction, some Christie's, uh, Christie auction, um, and whoever bought it, I can't remember his name, ended up giving back the medal, not not taking his money back. And he basically said nobody who worked that hard to earn that medal should ever have had to part with it. So it's a kind of a touching story. Um, but on the other hand, he did say some really insensitive things. And um, so uh, that's up for you to decide what you feel about that. But regardless of what you think about little Mr. Watson, um, the Watson and Crick base pair model is the the facts. This is what they discovered. Okay, so what you can see here is here's a nucleotide. Okay, that nucleotide has here's your deoxyribose, and there are the, there are the five carbons, right? And there's an oxygen here. Okay, so that S that's the sugar. Okay, and now here's the cartoony version of guanine. Okay, notice that guanine has two different rings, okay? And then these are hydrogen bonds that attach it to cytosine over here. Notice that cytosine only has one ring, okay? Also notice, so the five prime carbon has a phosphate group on it. Now, here's the next thing I want you to notice. This side, notice, is upside down, okay? So here's the five prime carbon on this sugar, okay? So here's the oxygen, here is the one, two, three, four uh, carbons for the sugar. And you can see there's the three prime carbon right here. Okay. So notice it's upside down. So on this side, okay, you have the five prime end facing up and the three prime facing down. And on this side, you have the five prime facing down and the three prime facing up. Okay. This concept is called anti parallel. All right, anti-parallel. And so here it is. Here's your double-stranded helix. You'll see that G always pairs with C, and A always pairs with T. Okay. Well, now, where did we see that before? Remember, remember Shargaff. Remember where he said that A and T are always found in the same proportion, and C and G are too. So. Even though Shargreff didn't realize it at the time, when he shared his findings with Watson and Crick, that actually led them to model this, right? So the hint that he gave them was, hey, check out T and A going together. And sure enough, when they looked at the, um, the uh, chemical models of T and A, it made perfect sense they fit together, right? These two, these two hydrogen bonds. And when C and G fit together, they had three hydrogen bonds, right? So Shargeff was also a contributor to this idea. Now, here's the thing. When Watson and Crick won their Nobel Prize, Shargraf, I'm sorry, Shargaff did not. And he was very, very disappointed and very, very angry. And what Shargaff actually ended up doing was writing angry letters to scientists throughout the world talking about why he felt he should have helped or he should have received the Nobel Prize in addition to Watson and Crick. Okay. Now, in the defense of the Nobel Committee, Shargaff didn't really realize what he was sitting on when he discovered it, and he published it. So when he shared his information with Watson and Crick, they're the ones that deduced the, the, uh, the keen, the hydrogen pairing, and the fact that it was built like this, not him. So, so there you have it. Okay. So the other thing to keep in mind here is that this is a single nucleic acid. Okay. This here is a chain okay, of nucleotides. 
and this is a second chain, right? So these are two different nucleic acids. So a nucleic acid is defined as a chain of nucleotides, okay? You put two of them together, okay, and you get your double-stranded DNA. The other interesting thing to point out here is that some nucleic acids, uh, rather some nucleotides are long and some are short, right? The T is short, the C is short, the A is long, the G is long. And so when you put them together, okay, you will always get the same consistent length between them, okay? The, the overall diameter here turns out to be two nanometers, okay? So you can imagine if you accidentally have an A and an A, right, two shorts together like that, Okay, you'd get this little pinch in the double helix. And likewise, I'm sorry, not A, uh, T or C, right? So if here's DNA, here's DNA, and then if you had either a T or a C base pairing together, they would pinch in. Whereas if you had an A and an A or an A and a G, then you would get a bulge there, right? You would get the big and the big. And so the idea here is that these are different kinds of mutations. Okay, and uh, the cell just won't stand for that. There'll be repair mechanisms or something else that will prevent that from happening. Okay, so here's another video for you to watch. Um, let's see, let's see if I can get this to work here. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, so I'm just going to skip this slide right now. Okay, so here's just another diagram showing you the structure of the nucleic acids. And what this is doing, this is highlighting what's called the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, and so, oops, oh, and that's how you do that. <laughs> Sorry, I just discovered that by accident. W hides everything, and I can draw on that. Good to know. All right, so you see here the outside of this? Okay, if we unwind this, we get it right here. Okay, we get it right here. And so this blue represents the sugar, and the yellow represents the phosphate. And so you can see this repeating element of sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. That's that sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, and then jutting out from there are the different bases. Okay, and then of course, so if there was the, the matching pair, it would be, look like this, right? And so if this was an A, this would be a T, and if this was a C, this would be a G, and so on and so forth. Okay, another cartoony way of representing it is over here. So there's your phosphate groups, okay? There's your sugars, and there are your bases. Okay, and so one of these, if we zoom into this, this is the actual structure. Okay, so you can see here are your one, two, three, four, there are your five carbons. Okay, there's your phosphate group attached to the five prime carbon. Okay, now because this is deoxyribose, notice that this carbon here is only attached to a hydrogen. Okay, whereas this carbon here, actually this should have an H there, I'm not sure why it doesn't, this would be a hydroxyl group number hydroxyl groups, okay? And then the one prime carbon here, this is thymine, okay? But that could also be A or G or C, depending, okay? So here are your four nucleic acids, I'm um, sorry, your four um, nitrogenous bases. Notice that there are basically two families of them, okay? There's the small ones, thymine and cytosine. Those are called the pyrimidines, or the pyrimidines. And then there's adenine, guanine, those are called the purines. Okay, so basically you have to match one pyrimidine with one purine. Okay, so an A pairs with a T and a G pairs with a C. Now, so you might be thinking, well, why can't uh, adenine and cytosine uh, bind together? And so if you go back and look at, let's say here, this version of it, if you notice that adenine and guanine, they slightly differ in structure so that the AT base pair forms two hydrogen bonds, and the CG base pair forms three hydrogen bonds. Okay, and just this simple difference between them, that three versus two, that actually has implications structurally too. So for example, let's say that you have a region of DNA that you want to easily be able to pull apart. Which one of these would you use? Right, you use the T and the A's. So if you can actually hunt for AT rich regions, and AT rich regions would allow the DNA to unwind easily. As we'll learn later, that's essential for re uh, replicating DNA.
Okay, so here's the double strand now. So this is, uh, those are the nitrogenous bases, and here's how you build it now. Okay, so let's look at just the left side first. We have the sugars, okay, there are the sugars, there are your phosphates, <coughs> okay, and so notice the sugars and phosphates link together right here, okay, and so this right here, that's the three prime carbon. Okay, that's the three prime carbon. So at the very end here, the one that's open, that's your three prime carbon. Okay, and the very top here, the one that has the phosphates on it, that's the five prime. Right? So you would say this strand here is five to three, right? And now let's look at the other side. Notice it's all upside down. Okay, this is the three prime carbon. Rather, this is the three prime carbon. Okay, and this is the five prime carbon. And so this one's running three to five, okay? Okay, and here's another way of looking at it. There's your three and five and your five and three. All right, so um, make sure that when you're studying this stuff, you look at it in all these different ways to really get a good understanding of it. All right, so now what we're gonna talk about is a very simple version of DNA replication, okay? So simply put, DNA replication, the basic mechanism of it, is divided into three basic steps, okay? And so here, I'll doodle this out for you. And uh, here, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go to my new whiteboard. So this is how it works. I'll tell you what, I'll use, uh, use some black here. Okay, so, sorry, here we go. Here's, let's start, uh, let's just doodle it like this. So here's, this is really hard to do. <laughs> um, with this mouse tool, uh, with this graphic tablet. Okay, so there's your double stranded helix. Okay, we're just going to pick in the middle here, what we're gonna do is we're going to take these bases, okay, which are held together by hydrogen bonds in the middle. We're gonna pull them apart. We're gonna yank this one this way, and we're gonna yank this one that way. And what we get from that, what we get from that is something that looks like this. Okay, and so what we do is we call this a replication bubble. Okay, replication bubble. And if you look at either side here, as these are basically pulled apart, this area here, okay, so I can redraw that and it would look like this. This is called a replication fork. Okay, so a bubble has two forks. Make sense? Okay, so when we uh, replicate DNA, okay, now what I'm gonna do is we're going to zoom into a replication fork here. So we're gonna zoom in like this, okay? And so let's just build this out. We have some nucleotides that are sticking out in space. All right, now let's say uh, this nucleotide here, this very last one, let's say that this is three prime end. And so this one has to be what, which one? Right, the five prime end, okay? And so now let's build the DNA. Watch this. Uh, let's get a different color here so you can see the different strand. Let's go back to red. All right, so let's just pick, let's say right here, we're going to add a nucleotide, okay? There's a new nucleotide. And so this and this represent the five and three prime ends. So what do you think this one is? If you think the answer is five, you're correct, right? Because remember, so what we're seeing here is the formation now of a new double-stranded helix, right? If we just lay these tracks down, so to speak, we're now building the new strand, okay? And so if this is the five prime, okay, this is the three prime, and this, this is the, um, sorry, I'm getting a little tired here, it's late. This is the, um, the carbon that we're going to add the incoming nucleotide to, okay? So that's the secret to this, is if you have the sugar, okay? So here's your five prime, there's your phosphate, okay? There's the one prime with the nitrogenous base on it, like A or T or C or G, okay? To build this, to where do I put the incoming nucleotide? The answer is right here, why? because the incoming nucleotide, the guy that's coming in here that we're building with, okay, so let's say that's C, it doesn't matter, has one, two, three phosphate groups on that five prime carbon. Where else have you seen this before? You remember ATP? 
from cell respiration and pretty much every other topic that we've talked about, right? These are triphosphates. This is where the energy comes from to build DNA. And so the only way that we can attach this molecule to, a, to a, the, the growing chain is by taking this area and bonding it to the three prime, okay? So DNA always grows like this, from the five prime to the three prime by adding to the three prime chain, or three prime carbon, right? So from a very cartoony viewpoint here, if that's the five prime, okay, and that's the three prime, the incoming one's gonna go here, okay? And so we'll grow it like this, right? And so we're growing from the five prime to the three prime by adding to the three prime carbon. So understanding that, you can see here, back up in this example, here's your three prime carbon. And so which direction is this DNA gonna go? It's gonna go this way, right? But now, and here's the problem with DNA replication. This, what I'm about to explain, is why we can't ever think that this is a well-designed machine. Okay, this isn't called intelligent design, this is incompetent design. If an engineer designed what I'm about to show you, they would have been fired on the spot. Okay, watch. Let's pick, let's add a new nucleotide right here. All right, so since this is five, this has to be three, right? Okay, oh, well, I can't grow here. All right, I can only go that way. But here's the problem. When you look at a DNA replication bubble, Let's redraw that bubble out here, okay? The entire, so there's two very large complexes that bind to these bubbles, okay? And so we call these big, big enzymes, these hollow enzymes, these gigantormous enzymes. These are the DNA polymerase hollow enzyme. A hollow enzyme is just a really big enzyme with lots of moving parts in it. The hollow enzyme moves in one direction only, okay? So each one of these big hollow enzymes moves along this replication fork this way. Can you see the problem now? If there's a big, 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 big hollow enzyme here moving this way, this strand's fine, right? He's moving in the same direction as the hollow enzyme. This strand, though, has to go that way. That's just ridiculous, right? And so what ends up happening is the DNA rep uh, replication mechanism has to keep building new little mini parts here. These little fragments are called Okazaki fragments, named after Dr. Okazaki, the Japanese researcher that discovered them. Okay, so that's DNA replication in a nutshell. Okay, now, so the first step here Okay, is to take that double strand of DNA and pull it apart or unwind it. That is mediated by the enzyme DNA helicase. Okay. Once the DNA is pulled apart, the next enzyme to play a role is DNA polymerase. What polymerase does is it adds those incoming nucleotides. Okay. Now the key here, the key here is when you lay down these new nucleotides they are not connected to each other, okay? These are not glued together. The only thing that's holding them on here are these very weak, tenuous hydrogen bonds. So the third enzyme that comes along, DNA ligase, glues them together, covalently links the five and three prime phosphate sugar area, okay? It builds the sugar phosphate backbone, all right? The English word here is ligate or ligation, okay? This is something you might see in things like woodworking where you have, you know, two planks of wood uh, stacked on top of each other with some, uh, with some glue. And so you would say that they're being glued together, they're being ligated, okay? It sticks them together. So DNA ligase is what takes those two nucleotides and glues them together, okay? Okay, so this shows um, the very basic overview again of replication. You can see here, here's your double strand of DNA. So step one is to remove the, or uh, uh, unpair these, okay, so to melt the chain, so basically to separate them. And that would be done through uh, DNA helicase, okay? 
and helicase separates them. And then the second step is you see these free nucleotides. These are bound to their complement by DNA polymerase. And then once these are loosely bound, they are then glued together. And so here you can see the glued part, and that's the DNA ligase. Okay, so the three enzymes I want you to understand here are helicase, polymerase, and I realize my handwriting is absolutely terrible here. Let's try that again. Helicase, polymerase, there's that line again, <laughs> and um, ligase, okay, DNA ligase, DNA polymerase, okay? So that's replication in a nutshell. Here's a replication fork. You can see the silver gray represents the new strand, okay? And the blue represents the old strand. And so the reason, um, or rather, and so therefore, because each one of these daughter molecules is half made out of old and half made out of new, we call this model of DNA replication the semi-conservative model. Okay, semi-conservative DNA, because it conserves it only half, so it's not fully conservative, it's semi-conservative. Okay, so to summarize this, DNA replication occurs in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Replication is continuous on the 3 to 5' prime template, and what do, we mean, what do we mean by that? Well, remember, if this is the template strand, okay, and we're building here, if this is 5 to 3, okay, then this, this has to be anti-parallel, 3 to 5, right? So which way am I going to go here? So here's my little mini quiz for you. If here's the template strand, okay, here's the template strand, and this is, let's just, uh, here, here's the 5 prime, and here's the 3 prime. You draw the rest, or come up with the rest here. I'll let you pause it for a second. Okay, so if you guessed correctly, then you would see, let's just pick a random place here. So let's put a T here and then, or oops, sorry, let's redo that. Let's just put a T here. Okay, so again, this was three and this was five. This has to be five, right? And so therefore, which direction are we adding to? Which side are we going this way or are we going this way? And the answer, of course, is you're going this way, right? from the five prime to the three prime, adding in the three prime area. Okay? Okay. Here's another picture. You can see on the upper right here, this, okay, so the overall hollow enzyme is moving in this direction, and therefore you can see the continuous synthesis of this strand. Okay, so we call that strand, we call that strand the leading strand, okay, and because this one is having all those staggered fragments, that's called the lagging strand, okay? Okay. All right, so here's another picture. I drew this uh, a few semesters ago. You can see here what I just drew out before, right? So here's the replication fork. I'm sorry, here's one replication fork, here's another, here's the bubble, and here's the hollow enzyme moving in this direction or this direction, okay? Okay. And so in eukaryotic chromosomes, the idea here is that there are multiple regions of the origin of replication, they call it, or an ORI. Okay, so everywhere within our chromosomes, we have these areas called origins of replication. And these are where the replication occurs. <clears throat> and so these bubbles form, and the forks end up merging together as they meet each other, right? And so what you end up with when you're done are the two daughter chromosomes, okay? Now, do you remember, what are these called? What's the relationship, again, between these two strands of DNA, right? Think about back to your cell cycle lecture stuff. If you guessed it right, you would be calling these chrome, chrome what? Chromosomes, chromatin, chrom chromatids, right? Those are sister chromatids. Good job. 
All right, here's another video you can watch on your own. Another video you can watch on your own. Now, one thing I want to point out, when you're watching these videos, there's three videos here. There's the origins of replication, leading strand, lagging strand. These go into details you do not need to know for the purposes of our tests, okay? So, <clears throat> when you study DNA replication, I want you to limit yourself to the, to the stuff we talked about already, okay? There will be um, things that you're going to hear, for example, you might read about or see something called primase. You might talk about things like RNA primers, okay? You do not need to understand that stuff for the purposes of our assessments. <clears throat> okay. All right, here's just another picture to help you out. Um, you can see, again, the leading and the lagging strands, okay? Now you can see there's helicase doing its job, there's DNA polymerase doing its job, and uh, there's ligase doing its job, all right? So this is a really good slide to study because this has the ligase, the polymerase, and the helicase, okay? Okay. Okay, this is the last slide of the lecture. The idea here is that now we understand what DNA is, let's talk about DNA damage. Okay, DNA damage is what leads to many, many, many progressive diseases, particularly cancer. Okay, so what's happening? Well, over the course of your life, your DNA is subject to damage constantly, simply by being alive. Your mitochondria producing ATP produces all sorts of toxic byproducts. We can think of this as oxidative damage, okay? <clears throat> you might have heard of radicals or free radicals or um, oxidants. All of these things basically damage DNA. And so on a given day, your body has to deal with somewhere around 20,000 hits to the DNA. Okay? And if you smoke or you do anything where you're exposing yourself to toxins or other sorts of high energy molecules, you're going to suffer even more of these. And so over time, you're basically going to accumulate this damage until finally something happens. Okay? But here's the thing. If your DNA never changed, okay, if DNA was always permanent, there would be no evolution there would be no ability to introduce new things, okay? New things meaning mutations. Mutations meaning new genes, new activities of proteins, new receptors, okay? Here's the idea I like to, what I tell my class. Uh, normally, <coughs> is imagine going up to your car and shooting it with a gun in the engine to try to fix it, to try to improve it and make it better. And that's just ridiculous, right? Shooting a gun into a car isn't going to help the engine. But imagine you had a hundred trillion engines and a hundred trillion guns, and you were shooting it in a hundred trillion ways, just randomly. You can imagine 99% of the time that's bad, right? But every once in a while, you shoot it in just the right way where something actually improves. Right? You shoot a hose and you move it a little bit, or you, you know, uh, I, I don't know the details here, but the point is, is that even though the chances of a mutation causing a benefit are almost infinitesimally small, they happen. And they just have to happen once to be successful. Okay? So imagine Earth covered, covered in billions and billions and trillions and trillions of bacteria everywhere. Okay, and each one of those cells is very rapidly dividing. At their peak, bacterial cells can replicate every 20 minutes. Okay, so take early Earth and take a single cell on early Earth. And you can imagine that cell eventually covering the entire planet in most places. It took over a billion years of constant mutation and change and growing to go from a single cell to a multi-celled organism. Okay, so just think about that for a second. Okay, all right, so I'm going to end that here, and um, so we'll say this is part one of the DNA and genes lecture. Part two is going to encompass uh, gene expression. All right, so I'll be doing that one next. If you have any questions, you can post a comment or you can send an email. My email is, again, it's andrew.ippolito at bucks dot edu okay all right well
have a wonderful night. I have no idea what that is. He's supposed to be waving, but that's a really bad um, stick figure, and I'm really tired. So I'm going to end this now. See you later.